Well, thanks, uh, Rich. This is uh, Joe Holbrook with TechieCast Jack. So today I have a very special guest named Rich Argenti. Uh, he is a DevOps guru. I used to work with him uh, at a past uh, contract I used to work, and uh, he was the go-to guy for cloud and DevOps. And I'm really happy to have him on board today to talk about what he's been working on lately and where he sees tech going and specifically AWS today. And, and he'll give us some insight about a recent project he's been working on around uh, AWS FinOps. Uh, Rich, would you like to go ahead and tell everybody about yourself, like uh, where, you, where you're located, uh, what you're doing, uh, any interests? Uh, are you a Buffalo Bills fan? You know, whatever, <laughs> <laughs> whatever, whatever you want to tell folks. Yeah, thank you for the introduction, Joe. Um, my name is Rich Ojanti, as Joe mentioned. Um, I grew up in New Jersey, moved out to Pennsylvania for quite a long time, and I'm still living in the tri-state area. Um, as far as like interest and stuff goes, I like to get outdoors, hiking, things like that. Um, as far as my experience goes, how it's relevant here, um, I've been working in DevOps for about 11 years with AWS, Azure, and working with a lot of CI, CD stuff. Um, and a lot of cloud automation work. Um, I've jumped between different roles between working in um, site reliability engineering, which is basically you know observability of web applications and things like that, and making sure they're online. Um, DevOps, obviously, the work around automation, um, deployments, things like that. And quite honestly, just um, cloud engineering with working with infrastructure. Um, I. Nowadays, I work a lot between all those different fields. And I also get involved with FinOps because naturally with the cloud, you have to manage the cost. And whenever you do something, there's a price tag basically associated with that. Um, I've delved deeper into working with like AWS EDP, um, basically it's enterprise discount pricing and things like that. So um, a bit of, I wear a lot of different hats and um, be able to do a lot of different things. So thank you and glad to be here. Great, excellent. Uh yeah, that's interesting. EDP. I haven't heard that term for a little while. So the last customer that had that was like uh, probably five years ago. So wow, that's, a, that's quite a while. So good, good to hear that term. It's been a while. Yeah. So as far as uh, your specialization, uh, basically in cloud computing, basically what uh, what do you think is really the most interesting right now for you and and what do you see, you know, around uh, some of the areas around, for example, uh, working in the cloud today versus maybe a couple of years ago? Do you see anything that uh, is really of interest, but do you see things changing at the same time? Any insight into that? Yeah, I mean, I think overall, I mean, the, the biggest highlight that I see is that there's like a growing demand, not a growing demand, like it's it was already growing in demand but it's continuing to even grow more just basically there's a shortage of the cloud engineers um, and people that can do solutions, architecture, DevOps, things like that um, in the field, just because so many, it, it's just mathematics. I mean, the more companies I've gone to the cloud, there's just been a growing demand and the companies that have already moved is that, you know, they've established their staffing and hired the people want to hold on to those people they've hired. Um, just because they want to keep that knowledge in house, things like that. But um, more companies are moving, out, and I see the trend growing towards. I see a lot of like Azure related jobs in the market, and even GCP jobs growing. Um, AWS continues to be consistent with opportunities there, but I, I definitely see like a lot of work around, like in my in my area of work, like Azure DevOps, um, Azure engineers, and I I see a lot of like hybrid roles where they're asking for somebody who knows um, two of the main cloud providers between like GCP, AWS, and Azure. And the reason behind that is that, especially the enterprise organizations, is that they don't want to essentially be stuck with one cloud provider. Um, they want to have some kind of power in, in, the, in the way that they do, they position themselves into a power position where they can leverage uh, one cloud provider over another with like with pricing and opportunity. They want to make sure it stays competitive and they don't want to. And, and that's the dynamics internally. I don't know if they actually speak about it in the market, but I know 
when it comes to speaking about pricing and definitely being in a FinOps role. Um, I've worked with like the executives and people in these roles and really that's the gameplay. That's the basic play with it that they're, they're really using. Um, but I mean, besides that, I mean, grow, growing trends and things like that, um, that really kind of like summarize it. There's a lot of things when you get to niches of each, now niches in each one of them. Um, what I think is exciting to me though, is like solutions architecture. And the reason being that it's the culmination of like all my experience. So like all the little projects I've done on my career, the bigger projects and everything kind of leads you up to the point of naturally being able to do solutions architecture. Um, and I think the big difference between like what I do and people like me do versus people I kind of like, like seek out to become solutions architects is that we have the hands-on experience so that we're actually doing solutions architecture and solutions architecture is basically just like designing a solution for a product, an application, things like that. And being an engineer and working cases and working different things like that, you kind of bring a different perspective to the solutions architecture thing where um, I think the native path is like solutions architects have been people that don't really get hands-on and they kind of learn the theory and how to like design things textbook, like textbook um, perfect on best practices where from my perspective, I kind of bring this whole like engineering aspect to say, to really understand like, well, that solution, that use case doesn't really work because of this, this, and this, like you get kind of down the trenches where you understand like how things are being built, the things to avoid mistakes you've done and things you want to avoid around that. So, I mean, I think it really brings a whole different um, perspective to things. So, but that's really my interest is at this point. Excellent. Yeah, that's yeah. definitely an area that it's, uh, it seems to me anyways, that it's an area that just has very constant demand. A lot of companies definitely are looking for solid solutions architects. And yeah. also too, I don't know if you've noticed, but it, it seems like, you know, again, it's been a while since I've actually looked, you know, per se for roles for myself, you know, mainly it's more for coaching and, you know, yeah. helping other folks, but uh, one of the things I did notice, uh, though, was a lot of like the cloud roles, they want you to not only uh, be, you know, sort of that rich, right? You have to yeah. know how things actually work and have done it before, but you need to get a textbook correct. I, I like the way you said that. And then also, they seem to also want you to be a programmer. They also want you to, uh, you know, do about eight other tasks that, you know, traditionally, from my experience, has not really been solutions architect material. It seems like a lot of the, the job roles, the titles that, that they use are really not even correct, but just any yeah. thoughts on that? Is that what you're seeing as well or different take yeah, on it? Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a couple different angles on this I could talk about. I mean, one, the one thing I'll, I'll talk about is the solutions architecture one. And what I've seen is like people, I've talked to people like at Rackspace that were like solutions architects when I was interviewing there. And they were talking about how they actually needed to be efficient in a language, maybe yeah. like .NET or you know whatever it was that they were using that because they were basically doing the solutions architecture, but they were also doing the implementation. They were usually like the specialists on a project to do right. um, a migration or whatever it was, but then they were actually like doing the coding for like the environment where they had maybe some kind of automation in place or they had to like code something as part of the migration part of it, like maybe migrating data or something like that. Um, they had to be, you know, that was, that's the part of it. And I think that's really different from what you've seen with solutions architects, where I think solutions architects were really just about like doing the design, coming up with the solution, and then working with like the engineers and people to kind of break those down into tasks for the engineers to kind of do that work where they were kind of like there to oversee things and make sure it was implemented right. I'm not sure if it's hundred percent of what the actual students architecture is on the, in the field, but that's what I've seen from those architects I've seen. It's like that, that trend has been there. Right. The other aspect of that is that uh, people like me. And the reason why I do so much is because a lot of the roles I got hired for, they required like a lot of skill sets that I didn't even particularly have, or I was like, maybe like a, you know, beginner level at them. You know what I mean? It wasn't like I really was seeking out to be like a, um, hardcore PowerShell developer, 
because I maybe I had like bash and you know my my Python abilities, but then a certain role wanted like you know PowerShell, but then they wanted you to be like a Hadoop expert and then like, yeah. you know, and it was like I'm just throwing out crazy things, but the, literally that's what they were. And for one of my roles that I full time roles I worked at, my CV was ridiculous for the things they had on there. And I just so happened to have that experience where I covered 95% of the stuff, but in real reality, I mean, it's yeah. almost like borderline insane what they asked for in some roles. And quite honestly, it's very particular to that company. And even from the perspective of how a company sees, let's say what they call a DevOps role yeah. is not really correct because DevOps is a DevOps engineer is not really a DevOps engineer. It's like DevOps is the philosophy of DevOps. I mean, it's basically the combination of um, like, you know, operations and developers working together. But what they did is they kind of bastardized it by calling it like a DevOps engineer, which I get why they needed because they were looking for people in those roles, but they're looking for like one individual to cover like everything all together. And really, quite honestly, it's really driven by the individual company then because that even changes, it skews it even more. So, I mean, I, I, I really laugh about the whole topic of it because when I talk to students or people in the field, even my, my people, my, um, my coworkers and peers in the field, we laugh about it because it's like a big joke around this. Cause it's like, it's just been kind of skewed completely where it's like, we get it, but like, it's just, everybody's out there is so confused, especially students are very confused around like what they're supposed to know. And asking people to know those things like right off the bat is just way too much. And I could get into advice advice around that, but these are the things I'm like really seeing around this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, I remember seeing a role that had uh, they wanted like 12 years of Kubernetes experience, and I'm like, how long yeah. has Kubernetes been around? <laughs> Someone, someone's, uh, as exactly. we used to say in the Navy, uh, has a short between the earmuffs, you know, <laughs> something isn't right. Uh, but uh, anyways, as far as uh, your recent project, I'm pretty excited to hear about it. You said you yeah. were uh, working uh, mainly in AWS FinOps role with some SRE DevOps and uh, other other aspects involved. Uh, would you want to tell everybody about uh, what what you're working at without disclosing anything. If you can't, you know, just, yeah, you know, definitely. Force, whatever you can tell us would be great. So in the FinOps realm, like this was actually a true FinOps role. I was working in for a drop ship company. Basically it's one of the main competitors to um, Amazon in this area. So it's, it's a pretty big platform altogether that they're working with. And what I'm seeing with the trend in this position is that there's actually true FinOps being implemented at this point. Um, and I'm not sure if this is because the FinOps op, you know, organization kind of establishes best practices and people are like looking this up and finding out this thing. But um, the CEO of the company was new um, to the organization and he directly asked for somebody to be hired on to do cost optimization and FinOps. So, um, but the challenge around that is that they kind of like got me into the role, but didn't really have any guidelines around it. I had to kind of like do it, figure out and establish the foundation around it, which had its own learning challenges for me all around it, but that, but all together, it was like a very interesting project because you get to essentially partner with AWS and they kind of help you uh, when you're, when you're working at the enterprise level and you have the enterprise support agreement, you obviously have access to the, um, the TAMs, which is the technical account managers, the account managers, solutions, architects. So when you're working at that level, that it, it, it's almost a pleasure because you really get the support that you need versus when you're working the small organization that doesn't have that kind of resources to get yep. that agreement. You're kind of on your own with figuring stuff out, which is okay. Cause if you're, you know, if you could think through things and work, do things, it's, it's okay. But there's, but there's very two different dynamics that all together. Um, besides that, I mean, I'm working in like an SRE DevOps kind of role where, my bread and butter in that area is really around like Terraform, cloud automation, mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, I dive into the CI/CD stuff, but it's really not my like. I, I I'm good at it and I'm decent at it, but it's not what I where I put my primary focus into things. And I think there's individuals that could really focus on being sole DevOps people, where they're really. What's interesting about that role is you can really then dive into not just the CI/CD stuff where you're doing you know, source control builds and then deployments with the pipeline. But then you can really specialize in getting into like 
testing, testing automation, and work in the products like Smart Bear and quite a lot of, there's a lot of different suites in the area, but you can really dive really deep in there and become a really a huge specialist in that area and become successful at it if you're really interested in that too. Okay. But, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. And as far as like uh, FinOps, uh, AWS specifically, you were saying uh, because you had like enterprise support, you had like a lot of yeah. help, uh, a lot of great insight and, and uh, probably much better support it sounded like as well. And as far as like someone like getting into AWS FinOps, what would sort of be the most common tools, you know, you'd recommend them to really learn in AWS? We, of course, know there's Trusted Advisor and some of the the common uh, tools that provide you some sort of like I call it, you know, wizardry or whatever, you know, just that high level insight. But to, to really get that deep dive, what would you sort of recommend to folks? Yeah, so obviously build a really good, strong foundation. Understand your tools that are available to you in AWS as it is. Like, you know, obviously trusted advisors really just kind of like, hey, we recommend this to you. It's a good kind of like um, just high level, like checkpoint alert on thing, how things are going. But going past that, like really really understanding your AWS savings plans, your Mm -hmm. reserved instances and how they relate to your organization because your organization might not be heavy on EC2. You might be really heavy on like um, containers or DynamoDB where you're like working with um, the, a different model around like things like, because with EC2, you're working the reserved instances, RDS, yeah. you're working the reserved instances. But when you get over to DynamoDB, which is interesting to me because I hadn't really worked the quite in depth until I got into this like recent role. And they basically have like reserved capacity. So understanding like, how that fits into things, how it's like writes and reads driven and how you can work with either one or the other is really, really important. But then getting beyond that and really understanding your um, your reporting tools is really, really important. Like understanding like um, what kind of days of data is available to you, what's the retention level on it, how granular you can get with that, how you can build custom reports around that and really diving into that world of the reporting And then getting familiar with like Athena and S3, like storing, like building data in there and using Athena to kind of sift through the data. I think that's really cool. But I think when you get into like enterprise organizations, the really big thing that differentiates um, those tools versus um, like FinOps essentially in like enterprise organizations is that you're not, you're not basically flying solo you're not a lone wolf because really yeah. FinOps is based around working with teams of people. You're working with finance, right. business analysis, financial analysis, um, executives, other team members, like engineers that you need to communicate things to. And what the beauty of these tools are, like with, uh, I worked at Cloud Health um, specifically, but other tools that I've seen that I haven't worked with directly is like, um, I think uh, CloudAbility yes. and um there's a few others. I don't want to butcher the names, but um, I, I would say that cloud health has been mine that I've worked with directly. Um, no specific preference to it. It's just that it's what I first started working with and I've used it in other organizations and I've implemented it. So it worked good for me. Um, I've seen, I've heard some complaints around it, um, but I could say that it does what I needed to do. So I think it's a good tool. Um, but the great thing about it is that going to what I was talking about when you're working multiple teams is that they're very visual people. They're not going to look at scripts. If you get them in AWS reports, they're like, I kind of get it, but like they really don't get it. And what a tool like cloud health will do for you is that you can basically create, um, you kind of like, the first thing you do is kind of like filter what they can see based on the report. So you can basically create some pre-built reports and kind of just give them what they need to see once they log in. Cause one of the biggest problems with the cloud is like, just like over information where they're just like, right. their minds get blown by things. So if you kind of like just create these like dashboard with like the information they need to see, it's like, it makes it very relevant to them. And it keeps the conversation around like FinOps really relevant because they can, they can understand what they're looking at, what's relevant to them. But what you also have to do is you're, you're kind of like, um, you're having to like kind of like sell things to people because you uh, quite honestly in the financial you're a salesman like you're basically selling like well 
we're going to do this because of this. And this is the reason why. And these reports help you to kind of sell kind of your, your, um, your, your objectives and the reason why you do things. The, the um, naivety or in my perspective is just like, like I would be like, well, you're going to save money because of this and let's do this. And like the naivety around that is basically like, that's not enough for people, even though you're, you're going to save them money. Like you have to like sell that to them. And to me, that was like kind of crazy. I'm like, well, if I'm telling you, you're going to save money, isn't that enough? And it's not enough for a lot of people. They want, they want to prove it without a doubt because like you're a new person in the role. You don't have usually like 10 years of experience, like five years of experience where they're just going to trust your word on it. If you're the right. new guy in the block, like a lot of times like we are as professionals, they want to hear more about that and they want to see like why you want to do things. So I think like a cloud health is just a tool that helps me do my job as much as like helps other people do their jobs. So. It, excellent insight. Excellent insight. You actually answered the other the two other questions I was going to go into. So yeah, a uh, great uh, preemptive uh, strike there. Excellent. Awesome. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> <There you> go. <laughs> so as far as, uh, you know, let's say you're an IT professional, you're working help desk duties, or uh, you're a Windows administrator, and you want to get into the cloud, what would be uh, sort of like your best advice to that person to get ramped up in cloud uh, as yeah. quickly as possible? Yeah, so I, like yourself, I also do like teaching. So I'm working with students again, I get this question quite often. Um my thing about the field that I've learned looking back and even I kind of dove into things in my career and just kind of did it. You know what I mean? I was the kind yeah. of guy I was just like, you know what? I'm not going to be afraid. Even though, even though I am afraid I'm going to have courage because courage is basically like, it's not the absence of fear. It's basically facing fear and like kind of doing it, you know? So um, that's kind of how I did it. I was just kind of like self-taught, even though I went to school for it, it just wasn't enough. And I kind of dove into it, but the biggest regret that I had was that I didn't learn the fundamentals. I didn't master the fundamentals as much as I should have in my career. And I basically bit me in the rear end because like I would face simple things as just like, I got to do something with the Apache server. And I just didn't, I didn't master it. I learned it enough to know my way around it. But when I had to do something, it was like, it caused a lot more time for me to get something done and things like that. And I was just like, man, that really hurt me. So really it's like mastering the fundamentals, but like not overdoing it at the same time. It's like learning enough to where you could pick it up and do something with it and then dive into the documentation on what you don't know really easy but like not going too far with that because you could get lost in the weeds where you're spending too much time on a subject where you're not learning something else. So, I mean, it's like, I know it's a fine line, but like knowing that where that fine line is really important. The other part I would say is like, don't become too crazy with your certifications. Don't become one of these guys that get an alphabet soup or, uh -huh. you know, of oh, like yeah. just basically of certifications. I think that's great. And I really admire people that could do that because it means you're really dedicated. But the problem is as being a hiring manager in the industry also yeah. is that when I see that, I'm just like, yeah, that's great. But like, that tells me that, like, I mean, again, this, maybe this is just um, subjective, but based on my peers and my experiences that somebody that does that means that they have very little hands-on experience in the field. They're very tactical driven from the textbook driven part of it, but it means that they've not spent, especially somebody spent the last year getting all the certifications. That means that you spent all your time studying and not even applying that. Now, I understand that certain individuals aren't going to get the experience until they get the experience. So like, I'm like, okay with that. But if you spent basically like 12 months getting 12 certifications or even five certifications, that means you spent your whole year just learning material and not mm -hmm. getting hands on with it. Because the things I'm going to talk to you in an interview or have a conversation with you about is like, how did you implement it? Give me an example of how you took that information and then built something with it. And let's have a conversation around that. Right. Right. And I'm not looking for you to be an expert at that, but what I'm looking for is that when you're doing it, even if you can't answer correctly is like you kind of followed the procedure and, and you did it and you had aha moments and what were the 
And what were the problems you faced? Like, talk about those. Let's have a conversation about them. Having a conversation about things is more important to me than the people that are going to answer the questions around like the specific answers. And honestly, I when it comes to like doing interviews, there's basically two schools of thoughts. I think the, yeah. the way that I'm talking about is like, let's have a conversation about it. And then there's the people that are just like, you know, where are the Apache logs and this, what, what is the directory where the Apache logs are located? Now that's an easy question, but they, they get kind of crazy with like very specific questions in like the Linux operating system and places like that, where in the field, like quite honestly, you could Google it if you don't remember it. I mean, like going back to what I do in my field, I mean, I, I cover basically 15 different subjects. Like how do I become an expert at like puppet Ansible and chef yeah. all at the same time? Like it's not reasonable. I mean, and I'm very honest with people. I'm just like, well, listen, I'm an expert at Ansible, but like I haven't touched pe- like puppet in like five years or seven years. Right. I need to Google it. I mean, it, it's just honestly what it is. So from my perspective, what's relevant is like being able to have a conversation around that. So getting back to what we were talking about though, is like, it's like being somebody that can be a hands-on with things, but also have like two certifications in place, I think is really important. Like if you're a beginner level person, pick up the GCP fundamentals, pick up the AWS cloud um, practitioner or the Azure fundamentals. You know what I mean? Those are great entry level certifications, I think in the field right. um, that tell that says like you got your certifications. Um, and if you want to take it one step beyond that, like, Getting at least one that's like a, like maybe a sysop, like the AWS sysops or the solutions architect, just one level up beyond the fundamentals. If you get one in that area, I think you're in good shape to basically like have those checkpoints off. Cause you remember, HR people are basically just kind of looking at things and they're just checking things off. They don't really, to them, it doesn't really matter. They just got to basically kind of cover that. Um, but what's going to get you relevant to like hiring managers, basically going to have that one step beyond the fundamentals and maybe having one, like that's like a solutions architect associate, a, you know, AWS, um, system, something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Beyond that. I mean, I think just like being able to have a good conversation about things is important. So I think, um, from the perspective of like keeping it like, leg- like keeping it reasonable, try to find an area that you're passionate about. Like don't become one of those people that are just like shiny object people I call that are basically like, like Python, like Linux, this and this and that. Try to pick up something that you're passionate about. Maybe you like working with like Linux on AWS or something, or maybe you're like a guy that like does, um, likes, um, I don't know, web applications. You want to host an IIS, like Pick one subject, maybe a web application, how to like host it or something like that. Quite honestly, you could take a WordPress installation, set it up on like an Apache server, an IS server, get really good at that subject to where you can actually have a conversation around it. And quite honestly, if you could do something like that, like I think you're relevant at that point. Could you have a conversation with something that you're interested in? And it's legit, it's like legitimate to like what you need to do in the field because you can't have conversations around like 20 different things. So, I mean, it's like, get, get specific about it, learn it and get, be able to have conversations about things. I think that's really good advice there. So. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, excellent comments, advice and everything. I think too, uh, one of the challenges in tech, I, I like how you brought up the shiny objects thing. And I even find myself doing that sometimes and uh, one of the areas that I specialized in the past was actually blockchain on cloud. And, um, you know, it's hard to learn all of these things, especially yeah. when you get like to, to my age, for example. So, uh, you know, the last thing I want to do on a Friday night is learn about, you know, <laughs> Hyperledger on uh, AWS, you know, ECS or something. Right. So <laughs> it's just, you know, enough's enough. Right. Uh, but I, I guess, you know, as far as, where do you see the industry evolving to uh, in the next, uh, let's say, two years or so? Uh, and what do you foresee, uh, for example, like from a career perspective, um, where do you see yourself going in, let's say, five years? So where do you see the industry going in the next few years? And where do you plan on going? So, Yeah, so those are really good points. And I'm always somebody that looks um three to five years ahead with whatever I do. I think a lot of professionals yep. do that as it is. I mean, I think it's exactly. all practice, but I think in our field, 
any technology field in the um, cloud, um, AI, technology-driven area. I mean, quite honestly, even infrastructures like VMware and virtualization, you need to keep looking there because virtualization is still relevant in the field. Right. So, I mean, don't dismiss it. I mean, it's important. But I, I see things being more towards... So I think there's three trends that I'm seeing. I, I see things... Some people are going to like not agree with me here, but I see some things even going back to um, on-premise with like VMware and things like that. I see a portion of the industry going in that direction. Now, I'm not saying the majority. I'm saying I see a trend going towards there. And the reason behind that is the, co the cost on the cloud, specific UK yeah. use cases where a database solution might not operate well with the database solutions that are being offered on, on, the, web, on um, the cloud. I'm not saying every single case, because if, if you have enough persistence, you could probably figure it out. But I've had Oracle, I've had situations with yeah. like an Oracle setup that just didn't work on AWS the way we wanted to. It just didn't. I mean, but I, I've seen some that did. I mean, I, I worked on projects where we did find a solution to figure something out with like a replication or something like that. Um, so I think that's a one use case, but I think more in my role uh, where the people like me or where basically see a lot of just heavy automation um being able to do that do that thing speaking from the role mm -hmm. perspective just being able to, to script automate and then have enough mastery of the of your cloud to understand what are the best solutions how to implement it be able to figure right. out well you know we got to do this this and this so how do we actually accomplish that but then but be able to do that if you're able to do that, you're going to be very relevant in the industry because the problem is that you basically have a lot of people are like, Hey, I want to come a cloud engineer. And then you become a cloud engineer, but like you just, you missed like the 12 yeah. years of the, my journey of what I've done and why I know how to implement something and why you should do it that way. There's no yeah. way you can basically replace that experience. It doesn't mean you're bad or there's anything wrong about it. Like you got to learn it. And uh, and this is like a big point I want to like really drive home is that, and nobody, nobody wants to sell you this because everyone wants to, to get rich schemes. They want to sell training to you yeah. that just like, you're going to become a cloud engineer and make it six figures. Like I, yes, in some use cases that can happen from the brilliant individuals or the people at the right place at the right time. But what nobody's really emphasizing is that it's a journey, you know what I mean? It's not a race, it's a journey. And we all yeah. make six figures and stuff like that. But like, this goes back to the mistake that I wanted to point out earlier on was that, you know, don't rush, be, um, be persistent. Like, don't have patience, but have patience, which is a paradox. It means have enough urgency in yourself to understand that like, you need to push yourself to continue learning and doing that, but don't do things in your career and your learning in a way where you're going to burn yourself out. You got you to understand like you're a human, like, and like, you got to basically develop a, what, what I always try to sell people on. And I, I believe in myself is basically you build roadmaps and everything you yeah. do in life. Now, the two things that I do is I basically do a, I do a career um, roadmap and I do a learning roadmap. And even though I'm a professional in my industry, making a ton of money, I make six, you know, six figures, yeah. make a lot of money. I mean, but the thing is like, I'm going to become extinct if I don't continue learning. So I got to, I got to have my own roadmap of what I do. So that, that advice really applies to everybody in the field from like beginner to the highest level in the industry is like, that's really like quite honestly what you got to do. And what I mean by that is when you have a roadmap and this kind of feeds into what you're talking about for, where do I see myself? It's like, well, I'm already at the kind of the pinnacle of my career as being an engineer. I could do more. I think what I'm doing, but like what interests me is like, I'm kind of got yeah. burnt out on being the guy that's been on call or doing these crazy projects. And I'm kind of at that spot where I'm building my own company from a training perspective. And even from a, um, a technology perspective because i'm kind of tired of seeing organizations build things and do things the wrong way and not fixing them 
based on my advice. So I want to do it the right way based on that. And it's nothing against anybody out there. It's just, I've kind of reached that point where I'm going to build my own company and do things in a way where I think it should be done. So, I mean, I kind of see myself being a business owner and really driving that from like the training perspective to the business perspective. Um, where I see other individuals in my, in my field, I see them just kind of getting more honed into this, basically the automation perspective and doing that. Um, where I see the industry going is I really see the, the trend going towards um, Kubernetes, um, Docker containerization. Um, but the, the other side of that, the other, I think, the other side of like what you can do, the opposite of that is basically serverless architecture. I see a huge trend work. I've, I'm supporting products that are building things on serverless and stuff like that. But most of all, which I think is the, the most phenomenal thing is if you get the, get the look at it, is that these organizations are working with is not just like, hey, we're a Kubernetes um, enterprise organization or a company. Right. What I'm seeing is that you have basically multiple products that are being built. So you have multiple products, like let's say um, an education platform, which I'll, I'll, I'll leave nameless. Um, that's basically the, one of the front competitors in the industry that works with um, um, kindergarten to um, 12th grade, um, higher education, things like that. When you have an organization like that, there's basically different products in the organization for each one of those. And they're, and they're quite, a, honestly, they're in their own silos. Like you have like K-12, like higher education. You got this and you got that. But in, in, in that product and what's being driven, what drives the technologies and those are basically the developers and the people that are building the products. Because quite honestly, like what might have happened is it might have been an acquisition. It yeah. might have been a product that just evolved into what they're doing. And, and that's the funny thing about the, the, the industry is that like these are like these are humans and people that kind of built the product that was on premise a while ago that kind of made a journey to the cloud. And there was like PHP or like there like the stories behind there tell such a bigger um view of like how they wind up on serverless or containers and things like that. So and it's basically there's a story behind that. It's not just like, hey, use Kubernetes for this or that or this. And yeah. That's the funny thing that I see in the industry. It's like it, what's being sold to you out there is just like that's not what's happening. What's happening is like there's a story and there's a use case of how that got into there, how they got to one from point A to point B. And even in that organization, there's actually multiple stories of how they're going from point A to point B. And what I'm seeing and, and, and the challenge, and there's even a bigger story we could talk about another time about um, being a site reliability engineer is that what's happening is there's basically like a team of site reliability engineers and that director or manager of the site reliability engineers has a big problem because he's got to basically manage like five or six or seven different products that are built with like um, containers, right. rancher, um, serverless on premise. They actually have infrastructure VMware and he's got to manage that. So what he's doing is basically like hey, SRE guy, Go out, here's your product assignment and here's your portfolio. Go out there and like, you know, if, tell me what's going on. And that's what you're going to own. You're going to tell them how to monitor things or you're going to work with them on how to monitor it and how we're going to implement things, how we're going to do that. And you basically have like all these individuals and the bigger story that's becoming a problem there is like now you have like individuals that are basically single points of failure. So the, then they've got to bring that knowledge base <laughs> yeah. back to the tribe and we've got to document it so that if I leave or this person leaves, there's not like a single point of failure. So like the, um, the challenge of even the executive level is like, it's mind blowing, even from the individual level contributors. Like in this is, this story is kind of evolving as we're as in real time, to be honest with you. So to answer that question with kind of like lead us to have like probably more conversations that right. I, I can get into. And, and for the sake of brevity, I'll just kind of stop there. So. I uh, really appreciate your insight. Great. Yeah. Uh, great uh, comments and really looking uh, forward to, uh, hopefully some future discussions down yeah. the road. Uh, how can people get a hold of you? Let people know your website, uh, how to connect with you, et cetera, Rich? Yeah, absolutely. So my uh, site is Rivia, R-I-V-I-A dot I-O. 
And my social media is hashtag um, Rivia IO, just like the other site. And that's pretty much how you can find me. And of course on LinkedIn. So thank you. Excellent. Thank, thank you so much, Rich. Really yeah. appreciate your Absolutely. time today. Thank you, Joe. And uh, I really like the uh, insight around uh, the FinOps discussion. That's definitely an area that I'm running into a little bit more uh, from at least a training perspective. So yeah. definitely seeing a lot of interest in that area. But with that said, thanks again for joining. And yeah. um, I'll talk to you again later. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Joe. And Have a good one. Yep. You too. Take care.